Chapter 1. Dallas Eyewitnesses. Who Saw What? By noon of November 22, 1963, in Dallas, most correspondents aboard White House Press Bus No. 1 had reached a rolling consensus that President John F. Kennedy was unstoppable in 1964. As the bus prodded its way along Main Street through a crowd of 150,000 cheering shirt sleeve Texans, the president seemed to have everything working for him, including his wife Jackie, who had not made a political trip with him since 1960. On the second day of his long dreaded and twice deferred fence mending Texas trip, things were going better than he or his strategists had dared expect. The day before, he had been acclaimed by big, friendly crowds in San Antonio and Houston. White House joker Dave Powers estimated that Kennedy attracted the same crowd he drew at Houston in 1960, but that another 100,000 had turned out this time to see Jackie. That morning, he had talked civil rights to 1,500 Texans in a Fort Worth parking lot, and they had cheered him lustily despite his subject and a downpour of rain. Then, at Dallas Love Field, after his big silver, blue, and white jet, Air Force One, touched down at 11.37 a.m., the president worked the fence, a sign that he was in a good mood. This consisted of walking along the chain-link fence between tarmac and terminal, touching the outstretched hands of his greeters. I touched him! I touched him! The teenager squealed. The hand-lettered signs were all friendly. Welcome to Big D, Jack and Jackie. As Jackie, radiant in a pink wool suit with matching pillbox hat, walked along at his side. At the end of the line, I asked her how she liked campaigning. It's wonderful, she said, flashing that quick, ineffable smile. There were even indications that Kennedy was bringing feuding Texas Democrats together, one of the unsung purposes of his journey. As the motorcade left the airport, Senator Ralph Yarborough agreed to ride in the same car with his old foe, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson. On the way downtown, I saw only two signs of hostility. One non-admirer waved a sign urging, Yankee, go home. Another brandished a placard that said, Can the Klan. Kennedy, who scoffed at the notion that the President of the United States couldn't ride safely into any American city in an open car, had ordered the plastic bubble top removed from his Lincoln Continental that morning. He had also ordered Secret Service bodyguards off the retractable footholds on the side of the car, where they normally rode when moving through crowds. He wanted to be seen, one of them told me later. Kennedy's judgment seemed vindicated as the 21-foot-long midnight blue limousine inched its way through the noonday outpouring of admirers. Both the sun and the crowd were warm. The big, shiny convertible was flanked by Dallas motorcycle policemen and trailed by the Queen Mary, the bulletproof and almost bomb-proof security car that always trails the president, whether at home or abroad. Both the president's car and the Queen a four-ton rolling arsenal are flown wherever he goes by C-130 Air Force cargo planes. From the first press bus, six or seven car lengths behind President Kennedy in the motorcade, it looked as though the Dallas police were being overly cautious. When they manhandled one well-wisher who had dashed to the side of Kennedy's car to shake his hand, a local reporter recalled that Adlai Stevenson had been battered by pickets just a month earlier. The Dallas cops learned their lesson on that one, he remarked casually, referring to the assault on Stevenson. They won't let any nuts get within ten feet of the president today. Minutes later, the president lay dying on the back seat of his car, his head nearly blasted off by an assassin who never got closer than sixty feet. If I learned anything in Dallas that day, besides what it's like to be numbed by shock and grief, it was that eyewitness testimony is the worst kind. As an old police and courts reporter, I had long been wary of witnesses who recall in precise detail what they saw and heard while their adrenaline was flowing in moments of great crisis or tragedy. Dallas confirmed my suspicion that victims of horror, no matter how eminent they are, suffer also from faulty recall. And now, the more that is written about Dallas, 
on the basis of eyewitness recollections, the more my suspicion is confirmed. I was in the front seat of that press bus, normally a good vantage point when the first shot was fired or when I think it was fired. I had just looked up and noted one of the strangest building names I had ever seen carved in stone. Or was it painted? Texas School Book Depository. When the confusion began. That sounded like gunfire, the reporter next to me observed almost casually. It was Bob Pierpoint of CBS News, who, like me, had ridden in perhaps 200 presidential motorcades and heard perhaps 1,000 police motorcycles backfire along the way. Dozens of witnesses later testified they thought the first report they heard was a firecracker. The thought was forming in my mind almost subliminally that the pop I had heard did sound different when I saw a man on the sidewalk to my left suddenly dive to the ground, sprawling over what appeared to be a five- or six-year-old child. I believe the man was a Negro, and the child he knocked to the concrete was a girl, but I wouldn't say so now on a witness stand. At that instant, I heard another pop. It sounded as though it came from almost directly overhead. My God, it was gunfire, I said, or I think I said. As I grabbed the handrail in front of me and half rose from my seat, I saw a uniformed policeman running across Dealey Plaza to the left of the president's car with pistol drawn. I remember making a quick calculation that something bad had happened because it is an old rule of thumb that no one draws a pistol in the presence of the president unless he intends to kill him or prevent him from being killed. At about this time, give or take two seconds, the motorcade, which most newsmen estimated moving at about 20 miles an hour, ground to an uncertain halt. With the aid of the Zapruder film strip, the Warren Commission later established that it was moving at 11.2 miles an hour. What's going on? Someone screamed from the back of the bus. At that moment, I saw a man I believed to be a photographer, but don't ask me what kind of camera he carried, struggling up a grassy embankment ahead and to the right of the president's car, ducking his head as if under fire. He was pursued, or at any rate, followed, by a motorcycle policeman who rammed his machine over the curb and as it righted itself, pulled a pistol from his holster. That was the first moment at which I consciously began making notes on what I had observed. At that moment, the grassy embankment was where the action was. My attention was riveted there, and so was that of a half a dozen other correspondents who had spilled out of the bus onto the pavement in a mostly futile effort to find out what was happening. I remembered this momentary distraction vividly when, after reading an advanced copy of Mark Lane's Rush to Judgment, I revisited Dealey Plaza two and a half years later to try to refresh my memory of Dallas. When I stopped my cab on Elm Street just beyond the book depository and looked at that grassy embankment, I realized in a flash how Lane, a clever lawyer with a book to sell and acting in effect as Lee Oswald's defense counsel, had found so many witnesses who thought some shots must have come from that embankment. One of Lane's best witnesses, Lee Bowers Jr., told the Warren Commission that something occurred in this particular spot which was out of the ordinary, which attracted my eye for some reason which I could not identify. What probably attracted Bowers' eyes and the eyes of a hundred other stunned spectators to that grassy knoll at that particular moment was the out-of-the-ordinary sight of a motorcycle policeman, pistol in hand, pursuing a gunman who, if real, had just committed the crime of the century. At that moment, I, too, thought that something had occurred in that area which was out of the ordinary, which attracted my eye. Later, because no witness testified that he saw a gun or gunman there, because the police failed to find any trace of a gun or gunman there, and because pathologists found that the president had not been hit from the front, I was persuaded by the physical evidence rather than by the testimony of excited witnesses that nothing more than that policeman's eye-catching but futile reconnaissance of the embankment had occurred there. Lane, incidentally, in discussing his painstaking research in an interview, has boasted that Appendix 1 of his book contains 
the only complete list ever published of witnesses present at the scene of the assassination. It fails to include the names of some 50 Washington correspondents who were in the motorcade's White House press bus, a list he could have had from the White House for the asking. To be a witness to the events that followed the final shot was like witnessing the proverbial explosion in a shingle factory and not knowing at each split second where to look. I would hesitate to testify under oath to some events I saw peripherally. With hindsight, I now realize that many of the words I frantically took down from the mouths of witnesses during the next few hours were the product of imagination, shock, confusion, or from something much worse, the macabre desire of some bystanders to be identified with a great tragedy or to pretend greater first-hand knowledge of the event than they actually possess. I remember trying to focus on the president's car downhill from our bus near that now famous triple underpass. I know I saw a big car pulling away from a jumbled mass of men and machines at high speed. Was it the president's car, the Queen Mary, or Vice President Johnson's? I remember now trying to count heads in the back seat, but my notebook provides no clue as to how many I saw. I am not sure I saw Kennedy's big Lincoln until it emerged on the other side of the underpass, streaking down Stemmons Freeway toward Parkland Memorial Hospital. At that point, I jumped back into the press bus. By now, those still aboard were pressing bug-eyed toward the front door, some screaming, let us out, and others shouting, go, damn it, go. For some reason, there were no precedents for handling the press when a president is shot. Our press bus lumbered down the freeway to Dallas Trademark, where the president was to have spoken. While other newsmen rode an escalator up to the press room, I ran into the parking lot and found a motorcycle cop. Straining to unscramble a babel of voices crackling out of his police radio. They shot the president, he told me before I could open my mouth. They're taking him to Parkland Hospital. This, I suddenly realized was the first word I had that the president had not only been shot at, but hit. As I ran for the street, I heard the radio dispatcher say something like, there is no description of the gunman. In front of the mart, I ran, literally, into the president's personal physician, Vice Admiral George Berkeley, whose VIP bus, like the wayward press bus, had been diverted. The doctor, whom I had known for years, slammed his car door in my face when I pleaded with him to take me to the hospital. A second later, a police sergeant I had never seen before, but will never forget, walked into the street and commandeered a car for me. Take this man to Parkland Hospital, and fast, he told the driver, a Mexican-American woman who had been listening to her car radio and thus was able to provide me with my first clear-cut bit of misinformation. I hear they got Johnson, too, she said, referring to the then vice president. Minutes later, at Parkland's emergency admitting platform, I noted two incongruities that unaccountably still stick in my memory. The president's blood-spattered car was parked directly under a neon sign that said, Ambulances Only, and two Secret Service agents were starting to put the fabric top on that car as the president lay dying a few feet away inside the hospital. Why now, I wondered. In the driveway alongside the platform, I cornered my first good close-up eyewitness, Senator Yarborough, who had been riding with Lyndon Johnson just behind the president's security car, was standing there in what seemed to be a trance. Measured against what is now known to have happened, he gave a surprisingly good reconstruction of events, and yet, there was an odd reflection on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony in his tearful story. I smelled the gunpowder. It clung to the car nearly all the way to the hospital, he said again and again. No gun had been fired within 100 feet of his car. Senator Yarborough is noted for his integrity. Was it possible that he smelled gunpowder as his car raced to the hospital at speeds up to 80 miles an hour? Seeds of the conspiracy or second gunman theory of the Kennedy murder were sown in that driveway and inside the hospital during the hectic, 
confused two hours that followed. One alert reporter, Dick Dudman of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, observed what appeared to be a small bullet hole in the front windshield of the president's car. Dr. Malcolm Perry, a competent but harried surgeon who had made a desperate effort to save the president's life by performing a tracheotomy, suggested in a news conference, apparently in answer to a hypothetical question, that there was an entrance wound in Kennedy's throat. These two quick observations prompted author Thomas Buchanan, who killed Kennedy, and a legion of doubters who followed in his footsteps to pose the theory that a gunman other than Oswald fired from in front of the Kennedy car, putting a bullet through the windshield and into Kennedy's throat. This lie traveled around the world while the truth was putting its boots on. While the Warren Commission wrapped a tight and senseless veil of secrecy around the windshield, nicked by a bullet fragment on the inside but not even fractured on the front side, and the Bethesda Naval Hospital autopsy report, establishing that the hole in Kennedy's throat was an exit wound, tabloid readers around the world swallowed the conspiracy theory. It matters not that the Secret Service has displayed the windshield with no hole in it and that Dr. Perry has long since concurred with the Bethesda autopsy findings. The exploded Buchanan theory, with variations, is still the favorite of doubters, from Bayonne to Bangkok. Mark Lane's heavily annotated and footnoted defense brief for Oswald is little more than a cleaned-up, updated version of it. The realization that the president was dying if, in fact, he was not already dead came to us slowly and terrifyingly as we pieced together what had happened and what was going on in the hospital from Secret Service men, the police, doctors, nurses, and finally from a priest who had been summoned to administer last rites. Where was the wound? I asked Senator Yarborough, whose eyes were brimming with tears. I can't tell you, he answered, unconsciously holding his hand to the right side of his head where he had seen blood streaming from the president. This is a deed that's indescribable. Shortly after 1 p.m., reporters were herded into a nurse's classroom on the ground floor. This is your press room, shouted Wayne Hawks, White House Chief of Records. We're getting some phones. Within minutes of that ominous announcement, we learned unofficially that John F. Kennedy was dead. A crying nurse knew it. A resident surgeon called his wife to tell her. I think it's true, but I can't say anything, sobbed a nursing supervisor. It was a truth no one who had covered President Kennedy for three years could accept. It couldn't be true. Reporters not facing deadlines sat numbly with heads in their hands. Then, at 1.33 p.m., Assistant White House Press Secretary Malcolm Kildoff pushed into the room with a piece of notepaper in one hand and an unlighted cigarette in the other. Standing at a gray metal counter in front of the classroom blackboard, red-eyed and tremulous, Kildoff read slowly from the paper. President John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. Oh, God, a hard-boiled newsman cried. Then there was Bedlam. I was standing in the corridor outside Trauma Room 1 when President Kennedy was wheeled out in a bronze casket. My most vivid recollection of that moment is of the dazed look on Jackie Kennedy's face. Although I had talked to her many times, including that brief exchange when we had arrived at Love Field just two hours earlier, there was no glimmer of recognition as she walked past me, her hand resting on the casket. At that moment, you could have heard a piece of surgical gauze drop in the corridor, but if a gun had been fired, I don't think Mrs. Kennedy would have blinked. I took a closer look at her a half hour later when I boarded Air Force One to see President Johnson take his oath of office with her at his side. This time I noted carefully that while her hose was saturated with blood, the skirt of her pink wool suit was only lightly flecked with red. On the way back to Washington, I looked at my notes. Sure enough, no fewer than three witnesses 
including a 17-year-old high school boy who had photographed the death car as it sped past him, had told me that Mrs. Kennedy had cradled the president's head in her lap on that wild ride to the hospital. In view of the fact that President Kennedy suffered a massive head wound, I now think it is impossible that his wife cradled his head in her lap and yet had so little blood on her skirt. How she held him, I will never know. Important? No. But the words of three well-meaning close-up spectators, including two Secret Service agents, are still in my notebook as a testament to the fallibility of human observation under stress. My next misadventure in first-hand accounts came when UPI's Merriman Smith and I, the two reporters who made that nightmarish flight back to Washington aboard Air Force One, sat down to write what we had seen and heard since 12.30 p.m. that day. We had both looked at our watches when Lyndon Johnson raised his hand at 2.37 p.m. Dallas time. When we landed at Andrews Air Force Base near Washington, after a two-hour and twelve-minute flight, we were startled to learn that history, that is, the AP and UPI, had already recorded the time of the oath-taking as 2.38 p.m. Newsmen on the ground at Dallas, it turned out, had been briefed by a third correspondent who witnessed the swearing-in, Sid Davis of Westinghouse Broadcasting, who got off the plane before takeoff. The three of us had failed to synchronize our watches. Rather than try to rewrite history, we accepted the time that had by then been flashed around the globe. Smith and I had a disagreement. In his Pulitzer Prize-winning story, he reported that President Johnson turned and kissed Jacqueline Kennedy after he had completed his oath with the words, So help me God. I reported that he kissed his wife, Lady Bird, but only embraced Mrs. Kennedy. At this distance in time, I am willing to wager that neither President Johnson nor Jackie Kennedy could say now which way it happened. But it was not just minor details on which the eyewitnesses to that day's history, some of them trained professional observers, disagreed during that flight back to Washington. On the important question of how many shots had been fired, there was dispute even among Secret Service men. Agent Roy Kellerman, who rode in the front seat of the President's car, told me, as he later told the Warren Commission, that he had heard a flurry of shots. President Kennedy's military aide, Major General Chester V. Clifton, told me he had heard four. Smith said he had heard three. I had heard two. That night there were many firm beliefs, but no sure answers except that Kennedy was dead. One of the most widely held beliefs was that the murder of the president was too monstrous a crime to have been committed by one man named Oswald, then being held in the Dallas jail. In miniature, this was the problem the Warren Commission would confront when it was named by President Johnson a week later to ascertain, evaluate, and report upon the facts relating to the assassination of the late President John F. Kennedy and the subsequent death of the man charged with the assassination.